Got to tell you, I like that. Uh, I like that bilingual flavor. Hope we can do more of that. We get some Haitians in here. It's going to get interesting. I don't know if you know this or not. He he led uh, worship in uh, Dejun and and Dizam, Haiti, in Creole. So he can't speak it, but he can sing it. Essentially. But he's working on changing the whole speaking part of it there. Well, turn in your Bibles, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We are, we're moving through this letter that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. We've, we've, we've titled this series, uh, The Perfect Gospel for an Imperfect Church. And that certainly fits Corinth, but guess what? It fits us too. It fits every church of the Lord Jesus Christ that is, that is on earth, the church militant, uh, moves forward on earth, declaring the gospel, uh, but we still battle with remaining sin in our own lives and in the congregational life. The day is coming when we'll be part of the church triumphant. The church triumphant in glory uh, doesn't have these concerns, but we do now while we're still on this earth. And we, we discussed some time ago with our pastoral ministries team as we knew we had an issue, a a discipline issue that was facing us that we needed to address. If you remember here and you've read our Constitution and Bylaws, you know that part of our Constitution and Bylaws speaks to the matter of redemptive, corrective church discipline. That we practice that. We practice that because the Scripture teaches it. We don't practice it because we think we're better than anybody else. In fact, uh, some of the language you're going to see from the Scriptures today says we don't, we're nothing. We don't think we're anything. But we are sinners saved by grace called to live under the Lordship of Christ according to the authority of his word. And so in our constitution and bylaws and implied in our covenant, when it says we will exercise a, a watchfulness over one another, that we practice redemptive, corrective church discipline. We knew we had this issue coming up. And so I said to the pastoral ministries team at the time, when I get to 1 Corinthians 5, then we will address the matter. It will just be a part of the flow of our congregational life. And so we mentioned to you last week at the end of the service, we called an individual's name. We read to you the uh, scandalous uh, sins uh, that have been committed, uh, have not uh, been repented of, rather have been met with a, with a, a growing recalcitrance and, and uh, stubbornness. And I told you last week when we began going through this passage that, that there's, there's one sin that will always lead to excommunication, which we're going to practice at the end of the service today, and that is impenitence, the unwillingness to repent when called upon to do so. So in your Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 to 13, I hope you found this in your Bible. If you don't have a Bible, we're going to put the text on the screen for you, but I want to ask you to stand with me, follow along as I read this passage. And when I'm reading it, I want you to remember what we read from Revelation chapter 2 a while ago that Brother Norman took us through responsively on the church at Thyatira. Immorality in the congregation. They weren't doing anything about it. Jesus said, if you don't do something about it, I'm going to strike her down and I'm going to kill her children. When people tell you they're that they don't believe in church discipline. What they believe in is letting the Lord handle it. And his handling of it is always brutal. If you don't believe that, ask Ananias and Sapphira in the book of Acts. I want you to remember that, Thyatira, when we read through this here. Paul has said at the end of chapter four, how do I need to come to you? What, what does my disposition need to be? Come with gentleness or come with a rod. And basically he's telling them it's up to you. It's how you respond. So now he, we wondered when we read in chapter four, why would he say that about this whole divisive issue? But he says that really prep, in preparation for what he's about to say in chapter five. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans for a man has his father's wife. And you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who's done this be removed from among you. For though absent in body, I am present in spirit. 
And as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you're assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world <clears throat> or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, a drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. Sobering words, to be sure. The words we must embrace because what have we just read? We've just read the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. Times like these test our willingness to embrace the sufficiency of Scripture. Thank you. Please be seated. I told you last week, just a real, real quick recap before we move further into the text today, that, that when you talk about church discipline, redemptive, corrective church discipline, when you talk about discipline in general, the, the very word disciple comes from that whole word grouping for, for discipline. And you're talking about formative discipline and corrective discipline. Formative discipline meaning the instruction. You do it all the time. Parents teach their children at home. They teach, they teach. We teach in Sunday school. We teach from this pulpit. You teach, the, the scripture says in Deuteronomy 6, you teach as you walk in the way. When you rise up, when you, when, you, when you go to bed, teaching, formative, instructing. But for that to be effective, there's got to be corrective discipline. There's got to be the other side of that, where, where you bring accountability to what you're learning. And that's what we see here. If you're going to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, you've got to embrace the teaching ministry of his Holy Spirit who will lead you into all truth, but you've also got to embrace the, the corrective work of the Lord, whom the Lord loves, he chastens, the scripture says. We told you last week that 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, which teaches us that all scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable. It's profitable, it's beneficial. For teaching, there's your, there's your formative discipline. For reproof, there's your corrective discipline. For correction, clearly corrective discipline. And for training in righteousness, formative discipline. If you want to set the matrix up here, to, to do away with corrective discipline, the two center terms, you've got to get through formative discipline on either side, the way Paul laid it out by the leadership of the Spirit. The purpose of this is that the man of God may be complete, that is mature, come, come to his ultimate design, equipped for every good work. So, we told you last week, it's, discipline has been recognized historically. We're, we're in the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation of the church. I told you last week, Lord willing, in October, we will take a look in those five Sundays in October at the five solas of the Reformation. But a part of the recovery of the gospel that came out of the Reformation was this recognition that Jesus has left the church with the ordinance of uh, believer's baptism by immersion and the Lord's Supper. But they also said, one of the marks he left the church with to be identified as a true church, historically, is biblical church discipline. John Dagg, I mentioned last week, who was the first writing theologian among Southern Baptists, he, he wrote the first manual of theology, of systematic theology. In his manual on church order, said, it's been remarked that when discipline leaves a church, Christ goes with it. When a church ceases to embrace and practice redemptive, corrective church discipline, 
they have no reason to believe that the Spirit of Christ, will, he'll be on the outside of the door like he was at Laodicea. So we mentioned those things to you last week. We cited some confessional background. I want to jump into the text today. Just remind you that we, we outlined this text this way. First of all, there is the absolutely scandalous situation in, church, in the church at Corinth. Secondly, there's the atrocious attitude of the church there. Third, the apostolic charge to carry out church discipline. Fourth, the awful leavening influence of unchallenged sin. Fifth, the application of Christ's death to congregational integrity. And then sixth, the actions of Christ's followers relative to the ungodly. We're going to move through the earlier portions of that that we touched on that, uh, last week. We're going to leave number six for next Sunday morning when we get together to celebrate the Lord's Supper. So let's look today. Number three. The apostolic charge to carry out church discipline, verses 2b to verse 5. Let him who's done this be removed from among you. It's, <clears throat> you're going to see that the idea of being removed from among the people of God is, is not to say to someone, you can't come here. What it is is to remove them from membership, to remove them from the rights and privileges of membership, to treat them as, as they were before they professed faith in Christ, to treat them as unbelievers. For though absent in the body, Paul says, I'm present in spirit, and as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. So Paul says, I've already dealt with this. I, what I've heard come back from you, it is scandalous sin. Let me say real quickly, when you talk about redemptive, corrective church discipline, you're talking about private offenses and public offenses. Private offenses would be Matthew 18. We read that last week. If brother sins against you, go to him and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you well and good, you've won your brother. In other words, the reconciliation of the gospel has been reestablished. If he won't hear you, take two witnesses. Because in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word is established. If he will not hear the witnesses, then tell it to the church. If he will not hear the church, then let him be as a heathen and a publican. In other words, set him out and remove him from membership. That's a private offense that reaches public implications because of unrepentance. What's happened in 1 Corinthians 5 is not a private offense. It is public and scandalous. So Paul's not walking them through Matthew 18. He says, I've already done this in my heart. And when you gather, as if I was present with you, you gather in the name of Christ, if Jesus' name is upon your assembly, in the power of Christ, if, if Christ's power is going to be present with you, then you're to deliver, verse 5, this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved. This idea of delivering him to Satan is to place him back in the domain of the unconverted, to say to him, we know you profess faith in Christ. But we've dealt with you about this, and you have been unrepentant. You've stonewalled us. You've stiff-armed us. You've dodged. You're acting like someone who's unconverted, and so it breaks our hearts, but we're going to have to agree with you at this point and remove you. So you hand them over to Satan. You place them back in the domain of the world. Now, folks, I'm not naive. That doesn't mean anything to most people today. But in Paul's day, there was the church at Corinth, the church of Jesus Christ at Corinth. If you were removed from the church of Jesus Christ at Corinth, you couldn't go join Second Baptist Church next week. You were basically told you are no longer recognized as a follower of Jesus Christ until you repent and return. And that's the goal of church discipline, is repentance, reconciliation, and recovery. You do this, he says, for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. You see, the goal ultimately is salvation. To be sure that what one has said with his mouth, his or her mouth, is something that's true in the heart. When you come to these crossroads, by the way, let me say it's true of any of us. <clears throat> the measure of whether or not we're real Christians is whether or not we repent when we're confronted by the truth of God's word. If we forgive when someone has sinned against us. So there it is. We talked to you last week about this matter of excommunication. We gave you five reasons to practice redemptive, corrective church discipline. First, to reclaim the offending member. Second, to deter others 
from being emboldened to commit scandalous sin. The biblical principle there, if you remember back in the Old Testament, we're going to do this, we're going to carry out this judgment on this person that others may hear and fear. That a healthy fear of the Lord comes over a congregation so the people don't play fast and loose with the Word of God and the implications of the gospel. Third, to maintain the integrity of the membership. We, we have what we call here meaningful membership. We have taken some time in years past to go through and make sure that, that the name of every person who is on our membership role is a person who, who shows some level of commitment to this ministry. As a result of that, years ago, we removed hundreds of names. I want to say that carefully. Hundreds of names, because they were not people longing to be present with us. If, to say you belong to something means you have a longing to be. To maintain the integrity of the membership, that membership means something. I told you back, we were going through that years ago, a, a, a fellow I knew who was a pastor was talking to someone. He said, I, I just don't know if we ought to do that with our roles. In fact, if we did that, uh, our church membership would shrink considerably. And then he said, that he, and I've always wanted to be a pastor of a mega church. It's sheer lunacy to think that way. Fourth, to maintain the honor of the name of Jesus Christ upon the congregation and the reputation of the gospel. This is not my church, not your church, it's Jesus' church. And his name is on this church. He's the one who calls us to be holy. Not perfect, but holy. A holy person is a person who's repenting of his sin, trusting in Christ daily. But an unrepentant Christian is a contradiction of terms. Fifth, to prevent the wrath of God from falling upon the church. We read to you Revelation chapter 2. Jesus says, I have this against you, Thyatira. Even though he commended them for some things. You've allowed immorality to go on in the congregation. If you noticed, Jezebel's sick. I've put her in a sick bed. If you don't take action, I'm going to kill her children. He takes us seriously. To prevent the wrath of God from falling upon the church. And so we looked at those reasons. You know, this, the fourth point, the awful leavening influence of unchallenged sin. He says in verse 6 and 7, your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? One of the children asked me last week, so what's leaven? Leaven was this, uh, and I'm out of my depth here for those of you who cook, but uh, it, was, it was like yeast. It, you put it in, into, and it, yeast of course causes the bread to rise. Well, so that analogy is taken without yeast, and, and we've, we've fixed some things at our house. I'll never forget, Karen fixed a banana bread one time and forgot to put the whatever in it. And we looked in the nice, nice banana bread pan, you know, and the thing was about that tall. It was just, it was just crusted over scrunched bananas. I mean, it was, wasn't at all like the fluffy banana bread that we, that we enjoy when she makes it. And so this image of yeast, of leaven, is used in the Scripture, sometimes in a good way, sometimes in a bad way, but in a bad way here. He says, don't you know that a little leaven, a little, a little immorality in the church at Corinth can ruin the whole church? Because there are people who will go, well, gee, I thought, <laughs> I thought we stood for something here, but I guess not. You know, that seems to be okay, so... He says, cleanse out that old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. A real church of the Lord Jesus Christ is unleavened. What do you mean by that? Listen to how Jesus uses it in Matthew 16, verse 4 and 6. An evil and adulterous generation seeks a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. And then he said to them in verse 6, watch and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. The teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, we've talked about that before, the, the fundamentalists and the, the liberals. So they're, they're, they're leaven, they're teaching, ruins. By the way, parenthetically, fundamentalism and liberalism both lay out the path for licentiousness. We'll discuss that another time. 
So Jesus uses it even in religious teaching that it can be a, a, a leaven that, is, that permeates and, and ruins gospel soundness. And then the fifth point. Paul applies the death of Jesus Christ to the, to the rationale for practicing biblical, redemptive, corrective church discipline. He says, for Christ, verse 7, for Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Jesus shed his blood for the salvation of sinners in Corinth. Let us therefore celebrate that festival, what, it, what, the, what the Passover means, that God has forgiven sin, but not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil. He said, what's happening in Corinth? Has malice attached to it? Wait a minute, they, they, were, they were being loving toward the man. Malice toward God, toward the death of Jesus Christ. Not with malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So he substitutes it. What I want to see at Corinth is sincerity. This word sincerity, we've told you about it before. It's, it's a word that literally means sun-tested. If you bought a piece of pottery in the marketplace in Paul's day, you would take it and hold it up to the sun. Because you see, the artisans were very clever. They could take a piece of, of pottery and make it, and if it got a crack in it, they could, they could run over it and smooth over it to try to hide the crack, a defect in it. But if you held it up to the sun, you could see where they had patched it up. It literally means sun-tested, sincerity. He says, I want the church at, at Corinth to be held up to the sun, discover the defects, and correct them. Don't gloss over. Don't pretend something is what it's not. Sincerity and according to truth. So real quickly, I want to just touch on what are the modes, what are the, what are the forms of Redemptive, corrective church discipline. There are three primary ones. If you, read, if you read Daniel Ray's booklet that we made available to you last week, then you know them. But in case you didn't, I want to give them to you today. There's admonition, rebuke, excommunication. Admonition can take private or public form. That's Matthew 18. You admonish him privately, but if it doesn't work, it doesn't bring reconciliation, then it goes to the public forum ultimately. Look at some passages with me real quickly. Romans 15, 14. I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct. And the word instruct there is the word admonish. Able to admonish one another. He said, you don't need an expert to come in from outside. You're equipped with the Holy, by the Holy Spirit with the Word of God to do this with one another. You're competent. J. Adams' book, Competent to Counsel, is based upon this passage. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. We were talking about this in prayer meeting recently. Teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. There's just that day-to-day that -day disciplinary practice of admonishing one another. And the means was singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. I hope sometime when we're singing here that the lyrics of the songs we pick, whether they're out of the hymnal or whether they're on a more contemporary scale, uh, admonish you, I, I prick your heart with thankfulness in your hearts to God. First Thessalonians 5, 14. We urge you, brothers, admonish the idle. Thessalon Thessalonica had a problem. People so preoccupied with the coming of Jesus Christ that they quit work. Admonish the idle. Encourage the faint-hearted. Help the weak. Be patient with them all. 2 Thessalonians 3, 14 and 15, if anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person. In other words, mark that person and have nothing to do with him that he may be ashamed. Sound like a form of discipline to you? Someone pops off and calls into question the apostolic teaching of Paul. You say, well, don't do that, brother. Don't do that, sister. You take this. This is serious business. Ah, it's just Paul. Uh-uh. We can't fellowship with one another. That's the way you're going to be about the Word of God. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. Titus 3, 10 and 11. 
As for a person who stirs up division, after warning him once, you need to stop your division here. Stop being divisive. Stop going around behind people's backs, sowing discord. Then twice, having nothing more to do with him. He doesn't respond to two admonitions. Sound disciplinary to you? That's exactly what it is. Knowing that such a person is warped and sinful and is self condemned. In other words, Paul says when a person begins to act that way and does not respond to admonition, he's condemning himself, calling into question his own salvation. So there's, there's this admonition. A couple more verses. 1 Corinthians 10, 11. Now these things happen to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction. That's the same word, admonition, on whom the end of the ages has come. So he, we were to learn from the, from the Old Testament experience. They were to learn from the scripture, uh, the good examples, the bad examples, so we know how to, how to walk in the Lord. And then Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging, and there's the word, one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. It's very plain teaching here. What well, makes you think you'll enjoy heaven if you don't enjoy corporate worship? I said it to you before, C.S. Lewis in his great uh, work, The Great Divorce, said if the way some professing Christians live while on earth Heaven would be hell for them if they were to find themselves there. Because they, they don't have the spirit of the psalmist. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. So he's admonishing these who are forsaking the assembling of themselves. That's, that's, that's admonition. Admonition that is rejected, though, moves to, to rebuke or to, to reproof or convincing, convicting. Let's look at these real quickly. Matthew 18, 15, we read last week, if your brother sins against you, go to him. Tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. You're going to him to rebuke him. Ephesians 5, 11, Paul told the church at Ephesus, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them or reprove them. 1 Timothy 5.20, talking about leaders in particular and the congregation in general. As for those who persist in sinning, rebuke them in the presence of all, so that the rest may stand in fear. See that here in fear concept? 2 Timothy 4.2, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke. This is right on the heels of 2 second, of second Timothy 3.16, by the way. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. <clears throat> Titus 1.9. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict you. See there the, the, the role of the, of the teacher, of the pastor. He needs to form, have formative discipline to instruct and corrective discipline to rebuke those who contradict sound doctrine. And, Obviously, someone in Corinth who's engaged in an immoral relationship with his mother or his stepmother has rejected the sound doctrine of the seventh commandment, which says, you shall not commit adultery. Titus 1.13, this testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Godly rebuke, biblical rebuke, is designed to draw a person to humility and repentance and experience forgiveness, and be placed on the path of being sound in the faith. They're warped in the faith, according to what Paul says earlier. And of course, John 16, 8, Jesus taught that when he, the Spirit, comes, he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. The Word should convict us, not only when we come to know Jesus Christ, but as you live a life as a follower of Jesus Christ, when you're encountered by the Word, whether you're reading it, whether you're listening to it on audio, whether you're hearing it taught, hearing it preached, whether you're just in, in dialogue with it, the, the Word should do its work of convicting. And this is the problem. The man in Corinth is sitting there under the teaching and preaching of the gospel and not being moved. He's carry, carrying on with this immoral relationship. And then Revelation 3.19, Jesus says, Those whom I love, I reprove. 
and discipline. So be zealous and repent. You see, a willingness to be reproved, as Hebrews teaches us that whom the Lord loves, he chastens, he corrects. A willingness to be reproved and respond to it is a mark that you're a follower of Jesus Christ. A willingness to reprove others in, in, in humility and fear and trembling is a mark that you, that you love Christ and are, are wanting to follow him and hate the thought, this person we're going to excommunicate, I, I hate the thought that this person could continue the rest of his life this way and end in hell with a church membership in his file. We're to do this in love, the truth in love, Ephesians 4.15. Look at Galatians 6, 1 to 3 with me. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual, now that's, we're not talking about I'm spiritual and he's not. The idea of you being spiritual is you're spiritually minded. You're thinking like the Spirit would have you think on the matter of what the Scriptures teach. You who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch over yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. And here it is. For if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. People might say, well, what, who do you think you are? Practicing discipline toward a member. Who are you? Well, here's the I'm nobody. I'm nobody. I'm a sinner saved by grace, servant of Jesus Christ, who loves God and loves others and wants to see others, whether they profess faith in him or not, wants to see others come to know Jesus Christ. Paul said to Timothy, the servant of the Lord must not strive. He must be gentle, long-suffering, instructing those who oppose. And the text is interesting when you, whether they oppose themselves or oppose those who are dealing with them. If peradventure God may grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, who've been taken captive by the devil to do his will. We do this in humility. People have thrown in my face, well, what about Matthew 7? Judge not, lest you be judged. Well, the judgment you judge, you shall be judged. Doesn't the scripture say judge not? Well, that Matthew 7 verse 1 says that. If you can read with discernment, the entire remainder of Matthew 7 is about making a right judgment. Two ways, broad and narrow. You've got to have a judgment. Which one's narrow, which one's broad? Sheep, wolves, judgment. Don't give what is sacred to dogs. What is sacred? What is a dog? Don't cast pearls before swine. What are pearls? What is swine? It's two gates, narrow and wide. Which one's narrow? Which one's wide? Two houses, one on the sand, one on the rock. The whole seventh chapter of Matthew is about making discerning judgments of what is right and what is wrong. So what it's teaching is judge not. Don't, don't judge by worldly standards. If you use a worldly standard to judge, then that standard will be turned on you. And what we're doing here is using the scripture and it's replete in our Constitution and bylaws in terms of how this is to go about. 2 Thessalonians 3.15, do not regard him as an enemy. We've already said this, but warn him as a brother. This, you you'd approach the person not as, well, I'm, I'm mad that this person's done this. Continue to do it. I'm, wipe my hands of this out of sight, out of mind. That's not the mentality. This happens to be an ex-son-in-law of mine. I'm grieved, greatly grieved. I did not want to see my daughter get married only to see this tragedy occur. Then there's excommunication, the most extreme form. And we've seen it described in Matthew 18, if he will not hear the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. We told you we've written letters to this individual, pleading with this person to repent, to seek us out, to make contact, specifically with Norman Hare, the chairman of our deacons. Letters returned. 
again returned. If he refuses to hear the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. And then, of course, the passage we're reading right now, 1 Corinthians 5, 11. He talks about, and we're going to look at this in detail next Sunday, I'm writing you to not associate with anyone who bears the name of brother or sister. He's guilty of sexual immorality or greed. Now, the idea here is not that this, is, this has been committed one time, but the idea is that a person guilty of this is unrepentant about it, has been called to his or her attention, and they continue in it, or an idolater, or a reviler, or a drunkard, or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. The idea there, if you don't, you don't have fellowship, it could be talking about the Lord's Supper, that you, that you fence off the table and you suspend their Lord's Supper privileges. Purge the evil person from among you. That's the apostle's last word. I said earlier, it doesn't mean that a person for whom this is carried out is not allowed to attend. In fact, we, we had a situation years ago where this happened in another church where I was pastoring. And the letter we sent up in follow-up, and we will send a follow-up letter on this, on this matter, is we urge you to put yourself under the preaching of the gospel. It's the remedy God has, has given for you to repent, begin reconciliation, and be recovered. Paul expected the unrepentant. He expected unbelievers to be in the church in 1 Corinthians 14. We're going to read that when we study later, where if an unbeliever comes among you, he expected there to be unbelievers. So it's not a, a banning from attendance. It's an agreeing, finally, that your worldly actions, which have gone unchecked, unrepented of, place you in the world and not among the redeemed. Now, here's the good news. Here's the, what you hope for, and I've seen it happen a time or two. Not many times in the years that we've practiced corrective discipline, but a couple of times, yes. If you read 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 to 8, Paul's talking about this same man in another letter. For such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough. What was the punishment? To hand him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. So you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him. He's repented. Or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So the goal is excommunicate. Pray to God that he will honor the biblical means you have employed on behalf of this person's soul, bring this person to repentance. I've seen that before. And they come to repent and to experience the forgiveness of the gospel. So I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. That's the goal, congregationally, to see a person brought to repentance experience forgiveness, be recovered to the ministry, and demonstrate the reconciling power of the gospel. I have told you that the one word that overwhelms this matter is reconciliation. Jesus died not only to reconcile you and me to God, but he died to reconcile you and me to you and me to one another by the shed blood of Christ. The responsibility of God's people to continue to pray for any person thus removed from fellowship, praying that God will bring him to repentance. One time we were dealing with this, and I tried to paint for our people in another place. Here's the picture. Jesus was teaching in a courtyard. Some friends of a man who was paralytic came and tried to get, and they couldn't get to him. So they tore off shingles of roof and they dropped the paralytic right in front of Jesus, right at the feet of Jesus, disrupting the whole Bible study. And the scripture said, when Jesus saw the faith of the man's friends, he said to the man, rise. Your sins are forgiven. Rise, take up your bed and walk. And that has struck me through the years. This person we're talking about is, is not in, in a position to even be close to us now. But my prayer is that God will see the faith, the faith action of this congregation and say to this person in his quiet time, and as, as he's reflecting, as he's, whatever he's doing, say to him, 
forgiven. But he'll repent. Come to Christ. And whether here or someone else, flourish in the gospel as a follower of Christ. I can tell you, this fellow doesn't care that we're doing this today. So the question, what, what difference does it make? It makes all the difference to God. It makes all the difference to God. And he is the only one who can change him. So that's why we do what we do today. It's to call you to take action as a congregation. For the glory of God, for the name of Jesus upon this assembly, for the good of the soul of the person being excommunicated, for the well-being. Think about it. I would hope, I would hope a married woman, a married man with children would have some relief to know that a church will stand in the gap for them when scandalous sin overtakes their marriage. That ought to bring comfort to the little ones to be protected from this. Because see, silence in our, our case is to embolden people to sin. Say it doesn't matter. Talk a good game. Just on paper though, it doesn't mean anything. And to be sure that when God sees that we're meaning business with him, that he won't bring his wrath upon us like he promised to do at Thyatira. We're going to bow for prayer. We're going to cut the video feed of our service. We're going to ask guests, if you would, to dismiss yourselves as our family takes up this matter. Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we come in Jesus' name, trembling with fear, mindful of our own frailty, of our own sins that we battle with. And yet gazing into the scripture as it stares into our hearts, knowing clearly what it calls us to do. So give us grace, Lord. Honor the collective desires of our hearts to see this one about to be put out from the assembly, handed over to Satan, that his fleshly lusts might be destroyed, that his soul might be restored. Oh God, give us the collective desires of our hearts. May we hear one day and see evidence that you've brought this one to real repentance, that we might practice then the forgiveness that comes when redemptive, corrective church discipline has proved to be effectual.